And it's not that much harder to do something good than something mediocre. And it's not that much harder to do something mediocre than something poor. So why do any of those other things? Just go for great in the first place. So that was the basic philosophy that led me to my third company. So I started my third company, Aspect Development. And I thought that the only way I could actually attempt, attempt to do a startup that had the potential to be great was to do it where the other great companies were, and they were not in Pittsburgh. The other great companies were in Silicon Valley. So I decided that I would start Aspect Development in Silicon Valley. And having started Aspect Development, I also concluded that I couldn't commute from Pittsburgh to Silicon Valley five days a week. It's a very long commute, not fair to the family. And I needed to work 24 by 7 to get it done. I was on six boards of directors in Pittsburgh. In Pittsburgh, I was considered to be a very successful high-tech entrepreneur. Various people wanted me on the board. And in one fell swoop, 24 hours, I resigned from all six boards. My younger brother, my niece, my cousin had all moved to Pittsburgh because of the successful career I was building. And I told them, sorry guys, uh, I have to do this uh, and, and take my entrepreneurial journey to the next stage, next level. And uh, literally in 15 days, we moved to California. We moved to Palo Alto, very near Stanford University. And you know, you might think, well, you've built two companies. How difficult can it be moving across the country? You really have to start life all over again. I didn't have any connections in Silicon Valley. I didn't have any friends in Silicon Valley. Uh, we gave up, in one sense, you know, the friends that we had made, many of them in Pittsburgh and family. But sometimes, when you start your journey as an entrepreneur, it is a lonely journey. And it's very important to have that feeling of confidence in yourself because otherwise, it's too easy for obstacles to get the better of you. And in hindsight, I have to say that of all the decisions I've made in my life, the two best decisions, one was the move from IIT Bombay to Pittsburgh to get my degree at Carnegie Mellon, which was then the start of my entrepreneurial career. And the second was the move from Pittsburgh to Silicon Valley, because it was only in Silicon Valley that I could compete with the best of the best. So on the one hand, I had the challenge of competing with the best. On the other hand, that's where the best talent was. And no great company, whether in software or any other uh, domain, can be built without a great group of talent in the company. And you have to find that talent. And if the talent comes to you, that's fantastic. And if it doesn't, you have to go to the talent. Because without the talent, you are not going to be building a company of any scale or any substance. In this case, the move to Silicon Valley made it easier for me to attract the talent. And it was a 10-year journey. We built a truly great company at Aspect Development. And as Laura said, um, the value of the company started to climb. And yet, in the midst of all that um, sort of success, it wasn't that easy. 1996, Aspect Development went public. Uh, I was the, not just the founder, but the chairman and the CEO of the company. Uh, I ran it as a public company for 15 straight quarters, always beating Wall Street expectations and Wall Street uh, um, <laughs> promises. But hold your applause, hold your applause. I missed the 16th quarter. Our stock was trading at $60 a share. We had gone public at $20 a share. We were trading at $60 a share. It was 1999, and uh, the internet bubble was building. So we were overvalued as a stock. And because we underperformed one quarter, just one quarter out of 16, the next day our stock went from 60 to 30. And over the next week, the stock went from 30 to 6. So in a matter of two weeks, we had demolished 90% of the value of the company. And I had two choices. You know, one was to whine and complain and blame fate and you know, accuse the analysts of being uh, sort of, uh, of overreacting. Instead, what I did, I showed up for work uh, the next day uh, wearing torn jeans and a torn t-shirt. 
and I called the 600 employees that we had in our Silicon Valley headquarters at the time. And I told them, I said, okay, guys, we messed up. I messed up. I'm, I'm the leader of the company. It's entirely my responsibility. I laid out for them a transformation plan that I felt would bring the company uh, back uh, and, and give it that same momentum it used to have. And while I didn't know exactly how Wall Street would value the company, I basically told them, three-year journey, uh, we are going to try and get the stock back to $100 a share. Uh, now, this was a time, again, 1999, when every single one of our employees was being courted for positions with other companies. But because of their confidence in leadership and because of their confidence in the vision that we laid out for the company over the next three years, we didn't lose a single employee. So here's a company. Here's a company that's lost 90% of its value, and all they have to go on is the word of the CEO. And the lesson I learned from that is that this relationship of trust between the CEO, the leadership team, the talent, all the employees of the company <coughs> is fantastically important. Because in the process of building a company, even a company that for the most part is doing extremely well, there will be adversity, there will be challenges, there'll be obstacles, there'll be disappointments, there will be times when you don't meet your performance expectations. Uh, if you're a public company, there'll be times when you'll disappoint Wall Street or you know the Bombay Stock Exchange. <clears throat> and if you have that relationship of trust with your employees and you have a plan for getting the company back on track, they will stick with you. But if you don't, they're going to leave, and then you won't have a company. So again, as entrepreneurs, it isn't just about having a great idea. That's the beginning. Absolutely, you need to have a great idea. It's not just about building a great management team, a great talent uh, pool. All those are prerequisites to success. You've got to have a relationship of trust with your employees. You have to trust them. They have to trust you. And that's an art form, but very important. Anyhow, we brought the company back. I thought it was going to be a three-year journey. And something absolutely amazing happened. Three months later, we overperformed the quarter. So our stock, instead of going from $6 to $8, went from $6 to $60. And then the next quarter, we overperformed again. And instead of the stock going from $60 to $65, it went to $100. At this point, in, in the privacy of my home, I was asking myself, what the hell's going on? Because I know we are good, we are not that good, and I know that we have great, a great team, but it's not that great a team. So I thought, okay, 100 is the high point, and if we can just hold it there for the next three years, I would be pretty happy. Another quarter went by, and we overperformed, and the stock went to $200. And this time, I didn't even have time to go home to think about what the hell is going on, you know? Six, 60, 100, 200. I have no way to know what the hell Wall Street's doing. So before I could go home, I got a call in the office from I2 saying, damn it, we wanted to buy you when you were at 30, and then we looked at you, you were at 60. We wanted to buy you when you were at 60, we looked at you, you were at 100. We wanted to buy you at 100, you're at 200. They're not going to wait a second longer, and they made an offer at $240 a share. Now, I'm not one to rush to judgment. I'm very cool, very calm, very rational, very logical. I like to think things through. So I took a decent 24 hours and then called them back and said yes. So that's how the $10 billion deal was done. So what's, what's the lesson to be learned? Mediocrity sucks. Go build a great company. Don't just be an entrepreneur. Be an entrepreneur with the aspiration of wanting to build a great company. So now, 
what the hell do you do, right? I've done, at that point, I've done three companies with increasing levels of success. Each has been a 10-year journey. There were some people who said retire, and I pretty much said, look, I'm not going to retire till, you know, my last breath. Uh, so that's out of the question. Someone said, <laughs> someone said, go be a philanthropist, do that full time. I said, yeah, I'm absolutely going to do philanthropy. I'm going to try and be uh, uh, the person who helps with the vision and the strategy and provides the funding. But can I do it full time when I have entrepreneurship in my blood? At this point, by the way, the mutation of the gene was complete. So the answer is no. You can't go back once you're an entrepreneur. If one company doesn't work, you're going to do the next one. And if it does work, you'll do the next one even better. So in this particular case, the question wasn't whether I do a company. The only question was whether I should do a startup or do something else. And I felt having done three startups, transformations, turnarounds, uh, fast growth, missing public quarters, that perhaps I had earned the right, based on my experience, to actually build a group of companies, not just one. And so I started Symphony Technology Group in uh, 2002, and the mission of Symphony is to build a group of truly great software and services companies. Uh, in that group, I felt there would be startups, I felt there would be uh, companies that we might acquire and turn around and grow. And back in January 2002, uh, and by the way, uh, I should also share with you, every time I've started a company, I've always had that same fear. And the fear is good ideas won't come, and if they come, I won't be able to execute them, and if I'm executing them, I won't be able to attract a great you know, management team and a pool of talent, and even if I do all that, the business model may not work, and if the business model works, Wall Street may not reward it, so I'm, I always have those fears, and those fears are completely normal. On the, on, on the positive side, I've always been able to overcome those fears and never have them become debilitating in a way that paralyzes me. And in fact, I would say fear energizes me. So I'm paranoid about competition, uh, and because uh, I worry about making sure that we do everything to succeed. Uh, you know, you, you sort of double up your energy and you just make it happen. So with Symphony Technology Group, I remember the first day I had set up an office, I had hired a secretary, I had written a big check to a bank account. I go in out there, four walls, and I'm sitting there saying, my God, now what? And somehow the idea started to flow and the execution started to happen. And today, uh, eight years later, uh, Symphony Technology Group is a group of 10 companies, uh, $3 billion in revenue, uh, 20,000 employees, and of those, we have 6,000 employees in India, in Bangalore, and Mumbai, and Pune. So it's been a very interesting journey because this time it isn't one company, it's 10. And those of you who are thinking of being entrepreneurs, you know, or if you don't know, I should tell you, it's going to be a full-time job. It'll be days, nights, weekends, and that's for one company. So I think you can probably imagine that with 10 companies, even though each of them does have a CEO, uh, it takes a lot of time. So that's where the next part of my entrepreneurial philosophy emerged, which is that sleep is overrated. Don't expect to get much sleep. You, you may not believe it, but trust me, you can get by on five hours of sleep a night. There's some nights when it's four and some nights when it's six, and on weekends it might be six and a half. You really don't need as much sleep as you're getting right now. So that's been the journey, and for me the journey continues. And uh, as I said, this is my fourth company. I'm in my eighth year. I'm loving it every day. Every day I wake up, I have a new idea, a new thing I want to do, a new dialogue I want to have, whether it's with the foundation, with Laura, or with Ajay, or whether it's uh, with the CEO or CXO of one of our companies. And so as I was thinking about my experience, I thought it might be interesting to put together sort of a top 10 list of what an entrepreneur actually gets to do. <coughs> so I'll start with number 10 and go to number one. And the number 10 thing on my list is you get to scare your parents. 
Can you imagine? Can you imagine going home and telling your parents who have all these plans for you, they want you to be a doctor, they want you to be a lawyer, they want you to join the IAS, get a safe and secure job in the government so that you can marry the right person, not shame the family, all that stuff that goes on, you know, in an Indian family, or at least most Indian middle class families, by the way, it happened in my family too, you walk up and tell them you're going to be an entrepreneur. You don't know it, you're scaring the hell out of them. So that's number 10. Number nine, you can save money by not buying a bed. You won't need a bed. There isn't enough time to sleep. So don't spend the money on it. Number eight, feel the passion. Because your company is going to be built around an idea. And on day one, the products aren't there, the team's not there, the capital's not there, nothing's there except your idea. And if you don't feel the passion, no one else is going to feel it. So entrepreneurship is not something which is, you know, just rational and logical and you do a business plan and it all hangs together and it should work. The more passionate you are, the more talent you'll attract around you, the more passion you feel for your business, the more likely it is that you'll be able to attract venture capital. And uh, so if you don't feel the passion, don't start the company because your journey is going to be really hard. So number seven, number seven, number six, number seven, seven. Um, celebrate your team. The key to building a great company is to build a great team. No, no person can do it alone. Uh, with all my experience, I can't do it alone. So you have to build a great team, and then you have to celebrate that team every day because that's what it takes. Number six, learn to beg. In my first company, when I was calling on the first venture capitalist, I was cocky. I walked in, I said, great idea, great business plan, smart guy, PhD, what's the problem? Give me my 150,000 bucks, they threw me out. By the time I was on my 125th company, I was begging. If they had asked me to crawl from the front door to the desk of that damn venture capitalist, I would have crawled. And you may have to do it. Venture capital is hard to get. And uh, if you're a startup entrepreneur, as most of you are, uh, the journey is going to be even harder because you don't have a track record to fall back on. Uh, getting capital will be tough, but as I said earlier, don't give up because if you don't, then good things are going to come your way. The next is about setting low expectations for your in-laws. Uh, the nice thing about being an entrepreneur is after you've scared your parents, uh, imagine going to your wife's or your uh, spouse's parents or prospective spouse's parents and you tell them you're going to be an entrepreneur, the first thing that goes through their head is, damn, there goes the dowry, <laughs> right? And the next thing goes through their mind, okay, I guess our daughter will be coming home after one year so may as well get used to the idea of this being a relatively short marriage. So all these things happen, and uh, I think it's a wonderful thing if you set low expectations uh, with your in-laws. Uh, the next on the list is learn humility, because if you don't, your customers are going to teach it to you, and if they don't, your employees are going to teach it to you. You know, the hardest lessons, but the most important lessons that I've learned, and the biggest scars that I have on my back, and I have many scars on my back, uh, have all come from customers and employees. So much so that I've made it a philosophy of spending an enormous amount of my time now with customers, not 
preaching to them, not selling to them, but learning from them, and doing the same with employees. Just to give you an example, this week, uh, since I, I, I had made a commitment to come to eWeek, and this was the central event for me, but I thought, I'm going to be in Bangalore, I'm going to be in Bombay, let me go meet the 6,000 employees that we have across the 10 companies. And I met all 6,000 employees. So I went to 50 different meetings over the last five days. And at each meeting, I spent 80% of the time asking them for their suggestions on how to improve the company, and 20% of the time giving them a pep talk on you know, our vision, our strategy, our future, where we were going. And really, the lesson there is there is so much to be learned from customers and so much to be learned from employees. They have a great deal of wisdom. Uh, the, best, the best thing you can do in terms of taking your company from wherever it is to the next level <coughs> as the entrepreneur is to learn to listen, and in particular, listen to customers and then listen to employees. Number three on the list, which is now great stuff, you get to be your own boss, right? You don't get to work for anyone else. If you want to come in at 10 o'clock in the morning and leave at 3 in the afternoon, you can. I don't recommend it because your company is going to fail. So as your own boss, you can make your own decision to get up at 6 in the morning and go home at midnight. You'll be working long hours, but at least it'll be your own decision, right? Number two, hit the jackpot. Sometimes you hit a small jackpot and a company does well and you make a reasonable amount of money, uh, enough for you to retire perhaps, enough for you to support your family. <coughs> and sometimes you get particularly lucky and or a combination of luck and smarts and hard work, and all of a sudden you have more wealth than you know what to do with. And not everyone's going to hit the jackpot, but I know one thing. If you don't try as an entrepreneur, you will absolutely never, ever hit the jackpot. No one. I don't know any manager working at Hindustan Lever or Procter & Gamble or TCS or any other company in India who has hit the jackpot. They have a very comfortable lifestyle, they have great jobs, they have great salaries, they get to do what their bosses tell them to do, but they have never hit the jackpot. As an entrepreneur, it's not guaranteed, and the degree of jackpot that you hit will depend very much on, on the way in which you manage all these other ingredients that I've been sharing with you, but you have this unique and extraordinary opportunity to hit the jackpot, so go for it. Number one, you might ask me, what is number one? And personal experience speaking here, the number one thing for me as an entrepreneur is that you get to live your dream. I've, so when I put all this in the context of India, you know, keep in mind that most of my companies were built in the US, but I come to India often enough to have a feel for the opportunities here. I can't think of a single country on the face of this planet with more entrepreneurial opportunity right now than India. Kiran talked to you about Kiran talked to you about so many different areas, you know, whether it's infrastructure, whether it's healthcare, or whether it's uh, you know <coughs> uh, manufacturing, <coughs> whether it's services. There are just thousands and thousands and thousands of opportunities for entrepreneurs. Uh, there aren't as many entrepreneurial opportunities in China, even though China may be growing faster than India, because the culture of China is not as friendly to entrepreneurship as the culture of India is. The culture of China is much more controlling, much more top-down, much more managed by the Communist Party, and India has an incredibly chaotic democracy, but in the midst of that chaos, there is real opportunity. And frankly, I think 
It's the chaos that exists in India that actually makes this such fertile territory for being an entrepreneur. So since all of you are here uh, as prospective entrepreneurs, and I know that you're among the most passionate of the prospective entrepreneurs that we have in the NEN community, uh, all I can tell you is go for it. So my parting words, live the dream, I have, you can, and we will. Thank you.